Hi, everyone, and welcome to another webinar in the series Restart 21. Uh, in a series Partnering Economy Next, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation uh, for Freedom Sri Lanka office has put together a series of webinars in which we uh, seek to explore ways in which we can empower and equip uh, our corporate leaders, both in large corporates as well as SMEs, so that they can navigate the post-pandemic landscape um, so that prosperity can return uh, to our country. Uh, and today in the series, uh, I'm delighted to welcome three industry veterans um, who will look at uh, how to navigate the post-pandemic logistics landscape. Um, therefore, I'm delighted uh, to welcome uh, three eminent personalities. Uh, their profiles are so large that I will actually do a disservice by trying to, uh, you know, read out to you. So a simple Google search will, will get you, um, you know, their entire careers. But just for introduction purposes, uh, I'm delighted to welcome Ramesh David. Uh, Ramesh is the CEO of South Asia Gateway Terminals. Uh, welcome, Ramesh. Um, hi. Hi. Um, joining Ramesh is Tanya Apolonovita Vettamuni, the group MD of uh, IAS Holdings. Hi, Tanya. Welcome. Hi, Imran. Um, and also uh, joining us is uh, Chamara Nanasinghe. Chamara is the head of cargo uh, for Sri Lankan Airlines. It's been a very testing time for the logistics Hello. industry globally. Um, you know, we have been um, there have been unprecedented um, you know uh, challenges in terms of the sheer volume that needed to be handled by the industry. But at the same time, with the kind of changing uh, you know dynamics of play uh, by the authorities due to the pandemic, plus escalating costs, um, and, and and I think uh, we are at a stage that we haven't seen in a very very long time. Uh, of course, this has filtered down uh, to, to businesses as well in terms of increased delays and increased costs. Um, but somehow the world keeps moving. Um, how did we get to this point uh, in, for the industry? And, and in your view, um, you know, when will this return to some level of, of normality? Yeah, so I think just a, a 30 second snap shot of what, how it all started when, you know, things started to go pear shape when China shut in, in the precursor to Chinese New Year last year, you know, at the end of 2019, early 2020. And shipping lines who generally, who traditionally cut some services in, in preparation for or soon after Chinese New Year, um, because of the onset of COVID, actually kept those services off for a longer period of time. Because looking at that time, they were they were actually staring down the barrel at, at potential losses uh, that were even more than what happened in the aftermath of the financial crisis. So they were looking at, at kind of, you know, 20 to $24 billion losses uh, as an industry. So Q2 of last year was bad and, you know, we had less ships. We had uh, ports that were not working because of COVID all over the place that spread to Europe, it spread to the US. Uh, the Far East was in a mess. Asia was also in a mess. Uh, but then something very, very strange began to happen. And people, you know, by the end of the second quarter, uh, China was back online, full stream. Uh, because of then the demand came back very strongly for, an, for a couple of reasons. One is governments continue to pay, particularly in, in Western Europe and in, in North America, governments continue to pay people or companies continue to pay people their full salaries. And uh, they had nothing to do with the money, you know, so people started shopping. And by Q3, this became really an avalanche that then combined together with huge surge in the <coughs> business, you know, the personal protective equipment in terms of masks and gloves <coughs> and spots. Uh, brought about some unprecedented cargo volumes. Obviously, the factory was the Far East, so you know all over China, Vietnam, Korea, they were they were the manufacturers, and the consumption was all over the world. So you had this perfect storm of of uh, sort of slightly reduced shipping capacity, and the shipping lines then brought back capacity very swiftly. So by Q3, Q4 last year, uh, the capacity came back on, but by then there was a third problem which had hit. Because of the closure of ports and, and, and closure of many businesses, the container inventory got stuck all over the world. So at in, inland points all over the world. And, and then you had shortage of equipment. 
uh, because these couldn't get back to where the production centers were. And then that's what started really the escalation of rates because, uh, you know, equipment became premium. By the middle of this year, that equipment problem got resolved because obviously lines and, and container manufacturers started producing vast quantities of containers. But by then, there was a, a fourth problem that had happened, and, and that is, you know, places, particularly in Western Europe and in, and in uh, North America in particular, uh, they simply could not cope with the volume of cars. That, so, you know, you had ports, we, even we didn't realize until quite recently that ports on, in the west coast of the U.S. only work for eight to ten hours a day. Uh, and, and businesses, uh, you know, there were no truckers. There were no, so there was this huge mismatch. And now the equipment is largely resolved. The, the capacity is largely resolved. But now you have this whole issue of the supply chain not being able to absorb this massive volume of cargo in the normal cycles that it has. So, yeah, I think, you know, Sri Lanka got caught in the middle of all this, unfortunately. And uh, maybe we'll deal with that a little later. But um, so we, I, I don't think uh, this snarling is going to, um, you know, unravel very soon. It, it is, we are going to see the stuff here in terms, of, in terms of volumes and in terms of capacity next year. Uh, the silver lining on that is for the shipping lines, of course. Uh, you, you know, you have uh, them making unprecedented money. That, uh, the global liner shipping industry will probably make upwards of hundred million dollars this year, which is which is huge. Um, so they are investing very heavily. They are also integrating backwards. Uh, the problem was exacerbated a little further by obviously the stop of tourism. Now, when tourism around the world came to a standstill. That took out 70% of the air cargo capacity because that is in the belly of, air, of passenger aircraft. That's where most of the cargo capacity is. Other than for freighter aircraft and, <clears throat> and people who were able to convert, then you had this other short. So I think these things are going to start coming back, you know, as tourism comes back, as uh, uh, places open up, then so we will see, we won't see the frantic problems we had this year. Uh, but I think we'll have a, a bit of a tetchy year uh, going forward as well. Certainly from a from an import and an export perspective, uh, we won't have an easy year. Yeah, I agree 100% with Ramesh. I think he gave an excellent uh, brief to uh, the topic. Um, yeah, so 70% of uh, air freight was based on passenger bellies. And that, that created... Uh, the largest headache for the entire supply chain when uh, things uh, got really stuck uh, on the other side where the shipping lines also had uh, the equal, I would say, uh, equal problems with uh, ports being congested and also uh, not being able to uh, clear out the inventory. Uh, well, the silver lining for companies like us has been, we are not the largest airline by any means, but I think the silver line was that uh, in the middle of all these uh, problems, we managed to find some sort of, uh, uh, how do I say, some sort of space to make some money uh, and, and keep the operation going, most importantly, uh, for the sake of the staff and also for the sake of uh, the industry when it comes to Sri Lanka in particular. As the national carrier, we, we took uh, some steps uh, to support the industry first and also keep the company afloat. We've tried many uh, options. I mean, uh, if I just uh, very briefly touch on certain uh, factors that we had focus on. Uh, financial year 16, 17 brought about certain cancellations of our commercial network due to uh, commercial reasons, uh, largely on the passenger side. Uh, we managed to get those uh, points uh, back online as a result of this congestion that, that uh, gave us the opportunity to, to look at a new model, uh, just flying the passenger aircraft only for cargo purposes, and then passenger piggyback on uh, uh, on the same operation. And we were, we were looking at repatriating people, at least 50 passengers apply. So that was a that was a new initiative, uh, really helped the country and also uh, helped uh, the bottom line of the airline. Uh, I mean, it basically let us 
stay afloat for the last uh, 18 months or so. And we also looked at converting uh, one of our planes uh, into a P2C model where we took off the cabin seats and looked at, uh, you know, uh, as, as Ramesh said, there was, a, there was a heavy demand for PPE. So those, those were, these were cargo which were more volumetric than dense. So uh, P2C operations are very much uh, uh, dependent on uh, the labor that you can deploy. It's high, high uh, density of labor that you need to load and unload. So uh, it was not the most favorable uh, practice uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a scenario like this where uh, we had a lot of restrictions uh, on, on people gathering. And here we are talking about a high uh, usage of people to load and unload. It worked for, I would say, straight away for almost one year. But then again, as we saw the PP is going out of the market or the demand uh, going down, we had to convert it back because the borders were opening and uh, the aircraft is now uh, with uh, the passenger operation again. Cash is king, right? So you need to preserve the cash for, for tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, airline operation is very, very dependent on uh, it's a high cash out uh, industry. So uh, I'm sure we will have uh, some challenges going forward in the next two years. Uh, we see a steady increase in cost of fuel. I think for any airline. 50% of your cost of operation is, is the fuel burn. So that's going to be uh, uh, very challenging in the in the years to come if both the cargo and also the passenger movements will have challenges. That's going to be really tough on airlines to manage the bottom line because I can't see any, any further cost reductions because we seem to have reached the... We are cut to the bone when it comes to cost. Uh, because we've, we've looked at many initiatives to reduce our cost uh, when it comes to airline operations as an industry. But uh, going forward, there will be further challenges where there is high escalation of costs uh, and also business might not be in, at the optimum level. Yeah. Thank you, Chamar. I think uh, the consensus is that things are going to be tight and, and tight for a while to come. Um, trying to come to you, um, look, you deal with, uh, the, you know, the other side of this, right? Numerous clients that you represent from various principles. Um, it, it's been very, very tough for them. Um, you know, how have they been dealing with this and any, any, you know, innovations, uh, different ways of thinking, business model innovations that they have done um, to cope with this that others can also then, you know, utilize? Yeah. So Imran, I um, just want to add to the, the previous question a little bit uh, from our side. See, uh, while the shipping lines and airlines are on the two sides of it, and we are the middle person, the logistic provider, primarily the freight forwarders. So so we, we suffered quite a bit because our customers have been depending on us to buy capacities and to maintain certain uh, rate levels to support their businesses so while the shipping lines and airlines made money and 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 had the uh, i i don't like to use the word upper hand but that's exactly what happened we were in the middle was really struggling to uh, maintain our commitment towards our customers uh, and i cannot see that's going to improve in the next several months to come coming back to your question yes sir uh, we represent uh, several uh, multinational companies uh, under IS holdings, uh, one of which a public coated company based in Hong Kong and uh, another large MNC based out of USA. The three things we saw uh, from our principals, so our, from our partners, because most of our companies are joint ventures, uh, put into practice was, um, as you correctly said, the word innovation, collaboration and, and empathy. See, some of them were very cleverly managed to reinvent their operations to um, the suit to the modern consumer and made sure that stations like ours, the smaller stations, uh, were guided through this process as very well so that, that we could face our customers uh, accordingly. And they also invested in um, technology um, 
especially in the AI, uh, Internet of Things, uh, rob robotics uh, in operation in Hong Kong to make sure that they can serve urgent needs and fulfill customer requirements. That was a very important because the, the word urgency because no one had inventory, right? Everything was like I needed like yesterday. So, um, for example, uh, we move a lot of um, medical equipment and so they invested in um, and, and invested and educated on the smart medical inventory cabinet uh, that have become critical in, in, in vaccination deployment. Second thing was the collaboration, right? It was very important in maintaining logistic networks and, and building strategic relationship. Uh, we, we should not forget this aspect with or without pandemic because that's that's the part of uh, our business uh, also we most of our principals uh, maintain very open and and transparent communication with the customers that's because very important to keep them informed of the latest import and export restrictions and any other information related to the the pandemic because no one had layout uh, information, oh, so it was very important to have this transparent uh, and open communication. Lastly, what was very important to us was empathy. You know, looking after our teams because they're the ones who work really hard day in and day out, uh, fulfilling our customer requirements and for the lifeline of our company. So I think these are some of the things that we saw from our principals and our partners. I think it's common to all industries, right? It's innovation, collaboration, and empathy. Um, I have a very quick question to Chamar and then I'll move on to um, you know, the future. This is, I think, the most important thing to focus on. You know, um, Chamar, any innovations that Sri Lankan Cargo has done that our companies, you know, um, uh, SMEs and corporates can utilize going forward? I heard somebody telling me that, uh, you know, you all were taking flowers from Kenya and delivering them to Australia using the vast new networks that you guys have created and the new routes that you've created. Anything that we can look forward to in, in the coming years uh, for ISMEs and, and large corporates in Sri Lanka? Yeah, sure. Uh, Imran, yes. So, uh, like I said, we, we've looked at many options uh, uh, given the opportunity in the market. Uh, uh, as a as a key industry stakeholder for, for Sri Lanka, we've been we've been trying to uh, basically give give create hope for the SMEs, the local SMEs who were dependent on the, as you, as you would know uh, that Sri Lanka has uh, a base load uh, when it comes to air freight, a base load of almost thirty five to forty percent of perishables. And you're talking about uh, a lot of SMEs who are in this uh, in this industry uh, who need support uh, with uh, on time uh, uh, because it's a very time sensitive uh, product we are talking about. And I, I go back to May last year where uh, when uh, the government was uh, looking at solutions to uh, the, the issues that was created in the supply chain and we were we, i mean as a, as a country we were we were facing the challenge of getting our exports on time uh, out of sri lanka that's the time that we we, we took the uh, we took a bold step to create a network of 21 stations uh, only only uh, operated for cargo purposes like I said earlier, and and that created the opportunity for the SMEs to really depend on this product because that we we were the only direct carrier in terms of uh, the, the the network that we created. I mean, we created certain destinations all long haul: London, Frankfurt, Paris, Milan. Not only that, Sydney, Melbourne. And also, we created options like the Nairobi option for, for the customers who had been working with us globally, uh, who, were, who, were, who, were, who were basically feeling the heat of uh, things uh, and challenging, uh, I mean, the challenges that they've had. So, uh, I'm sure, yes, we are, we are pursuing many options uh, as we take on uh, the challenges that, that we come across uh, one of the one of the options that we are seriously looking at is 
to have our own freight aircraft uh, because we seen that uh, we have already uh, uh, we should we should have had the freight yesterday we are we are we are a little late on this but then again uh, you know everything has a time i guess so i think it is it is at the it is the correct time to have uh, a freighter in our fleet so that we can really complement uh, the requirement of the industry not only in sri lanka but also in in the in the whole network that we operate to now i come to a very important uh, segment that i really you know want to touch on where i get the view of all of you um in a general question that that uh, you know uh, that that seems to have come up very regularly but we don't seem to have really focused on from a national perspective i think uh, our our role is not just about corporates i think we need to look at it from a national perspective as well beyond our airports beyond beyond our ports the the domestic you know infrastructure within uh, the country remains challenging if, if i put it diplomatically right um the perishable you know we don't have the kind of infrastructure uh, to make, you know for our agricultural uh, produce to be you know stored um, um, as huge wastage um and and that's something that uh, you know uh, what we are going through in the country now really you know uh, could have been prevented to some extent had we that infrastructure been put in um you know we we, we have um, a domestic uh, a road network you know 97% of of the cargo moves within the country I, i saw world bank report talk about that and and some of those trucks are quite empty you know on the way back um i think even for shipping i think uh, some of the containers that come from china uh, you know 20 foot containers are not the ones that go out to say the us which are 40 foot containers and so there's so so, so many uh, you know um things that we can look at in terms of improving our domestic uh, infrastructure as well um you all are veterans in the industry what can from a national perspective can we do to kind of strengthen our domestic infrastructure anyone can go first please i believe uh, we all this is a mindset change for the country right i believe that using modern technology digitalization the improved transport connectivity the multimodal transport and better coordination what is important between the stakeholders are critical for us to improve this uh, infrastructure you look at today our ports and the airport we are talking about hub right and the location and hub the importance of uh, building our logistic aspect out of sri lanka i mean we have 22 air cargo villages romesh you know about it more than me it has not been uh, improved or developed last so many years even even the facilities the the warehouses inside the port right uh, it's it's so so outdated so i think it's important that we have the proper you correctly said the infrastructure improved in sri lanka but what is mostly important also the connection and coordination between the different stakeholders i think that has to be sorted before anything else it it's common not in only in logistics you look at basic uh, road development we have today the 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 water board coming doing something then the next day electricity board so this the coordination in the the coordination between the stakeholders are really a paramount and important before we talk about anything else to stop this wastage and to look at improving and having proper connectivity and and to bring our standards up to the up to the world class i leave expertise like romesh to say something beyond that yeah thanks uh, tanya you know i think imran if we look at two two sides to this there, there is an element of domestic efficiency that is required for our aspirations in terms of our international trade both from an import and export perspective as as well as our hub activities that's an entirely different set of requirements and imperatives but you know what you touched on earlier is even more or as important if you take simple things like uh per- the transport of perishables and the transport of uh, perishable goods and and products within the country now this is something we have been struggling with for 100 years uh, in fact it was much better organized and and there was less waste today there's an estimated 40 to 45% of of farm produce is wasted before it even gets to the consumer uh 50 or 60 years ago when they came in wicker baskets in the night mails and the night trains from all over the country it was much less um but if we if we look at that i mean again i have to agree with tanya that there is there is both a technology solution 
and and the meshing of that technology with awareness and and real investment in you know in in, in the situation today where uh, where where the tech is is a great equalizer you don't need to have large businesses and you know the large type of infrastructure investment that we had uh, that was a prerequisite for say making multiple warehouses running fleets of transport today we can uberize transport i mean uh, the, the green supply chain that we that is referred to is, is just lip service here nice. you have the biggest companies and the biggest vendors uh, running trucks one way uh, you have you know okay we, our organized retail is only 25% 27% of our total retail the informal sector the small mom and pop store and the small producer is still 75% of our of, of our of our domestic economy Now, organizing that in an in an environment where technology can be leveraged is very simple, today, and it can be done. I'm sorry, let me say it. It's not simple, but it can be done. There is a solution. Does it mean cutting out the middleman? Does it mean empowering the middleman? Does it mean empowering the farmer? You know, how how do we get? How do we bring this waste? How do we match consumption with production? How do we match transport with the need? It's all there. We have trucks. You know, if you if you take the the industry from 100 years ago the trucks that came down from the estate with the teachers took back the provisions for the estates and the supplies and the machinery why aren't we doing that today today we are running uh, empty trucks why why are companies why are we not looking you know pick me and uber um, uh, bring efficiency to to transport by way of uh, by, by way of you know matching demand with supply There's no reason why we can't do that for trucks. Pikmi has been trying to do that, but again, there is this reticence amongst people, this suspicion. Uh, so we need to get, you know, we need to, and I think the information age and the ability, you know, the the fact that this is so ubiquitous, the, the, the smartphone, and today the farmer, the young farmer, trying, you know, we 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 should be able to use this to empower these guys, everyone. so that's going to happen and i and i think we we will not we will not be able to stop that but what we need to do is what do we need to do in order to provoke that and and that means encouraging people to get into businesses like how do we like solving the issue of uh, produce going waste like solving the issue of empty legs on transport like solving the issue of warehouses being in the wrong place and and consumption being in the wrong place how do we You know, these are the challenges that our our tech firms also and our young people, young groups need to be confronted. Because if they leave it to the to the big names and the listed companies, it's not going to happen. Because it's the, the only review, the, the the only yardstick there is return on equity and return on capital. So, and, and I think these are not solutions that can depend only on that. Those are important. You also have. a situation where the use of automation and and technology can now be used to implement standards part of the problem that we have part of the problem with this simple thing like waste is the lack of standards lack of uh, packing standards lack of transportation standards like lack of picking standards by the farmer now these are very easily fixable again through the use of tech so i think using using that and and if i take a more uh, uh, more sort of a closer example it just scheduling traffic on the road we have container transport and if i take an example that i that that is so sort of near and dear to me we have massive peaks and troughs in the use of container transport on the on the streets and at the port gates now this is such a simple thing to fix we need to book the vehicle everybody needs to get a time within which he, he or she comes to the port and you come at that time you pick up your box you bring a box to the port and you take a box back from the port but why don't we do why we can't do that because we have an army of golf clerks who have a certain way in which they work they only clear at a certain point in the day and they want all their containers by the evening so there is mayhem on the roads as mayhem at the port gates now we can't have the cake and eat it you know we have to be able to do all these things we have to bring structure and form and discipline and we have to use tech to uh, to do that and to a certain extent we have to use the authority of uh, the statutes also in terms of you know have to force the organization of of, of uh, and and force the discipline through the through the road use through the port use through the airport use things like that
we we also have uh, you know if a uh, the the you know the delivery and 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 the storage infrastructure in the country has has been neglected everybody wants to do you know the, the, the whole the whole concept of common user transport common user storage um is has never been mooted here because it has been used as a differentiator you know you, the ability to invest the ability to have your own warehouse uh, has so far been seen as a greater um a greater advantage than actually optimizing a third party or optimizing mm. the space of your own warehouse you know by selling maybe a rack or a pallet or selling less than a truck load so here again i i keep harping back to the fact that we are in an age where information is you know the, the is so prolific the use of it the access to it is so prolific and you know it, it's not old guys like us who me who need to do this it's the it's the young people who need to get excited by these problems and i think the role the government really has to play there is how do you keep these young people excited and engaged about staying in this country that groups of them are you know heading for the hills and heading and <laughs> making successes in other countries so i think that's that's the challenge before us and I, but i think you know, i have a lot of confidence that it will happen because people see the sense Chamala, yeah, yes, Imran. Uh, let me just uh, pick up from uh, from uh, what Ramesh and Tanya both mentioned, uh, especially on the wastage imperishables uh, being a base market of air freight. This is very close to my uh, activity and also my uh, responsibility and accountability to the industry. Uh, Yes. So, in this uh, aspect, I think as the national carrier, we've taken two major steps. One is that we are very mindful of of the wastage that could uh, happen during the transit uh, uh, from a from a from the truck uh, deck up to the aircraft door. There is a transit time of five to four hours uh, in the in the shed. now uh, being coming from a tropical country like ours the the, the temperatures could go up to about inside the inside the terminal it could it, it could go up to uh, about 28 to 30 degrees on any day so this can have a major effect on the quality of the product the more time it sits on the floor in the shed would would have uh, uh, would affect the, the quality of the product hence we've taken measures in fact we have gone to the board with a proposal of making a uh, uh, area of space 100% coal chain compliant so that it gets off the truck and it gets into an environment where it is it is held it is kept in the correct temperature zone which will definitely keep the quality of the product and uh, in 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 terms of uh, in terms of the wastage whatever is happening within the shed at the airport will be minimized and we've also come up with a proposal to the to the ministry or, or the state ministry that we would like to have a one stop shop that's that's the word that i would like to call where all the board agencies are present including the customs and the security personnel and we we make it just one stop for all the checks and regulatory approvals and once once you get the approval it's it's a straight into the the sri lankan shed which is uh, we are the handling agent for all all airlines that happens out of bia and martala so you get to the truck deck with all approvals um talking about about the next generation of of leaders of of the industry atani i'd like to come to you and and you know um i think it's going to be very critical that we have the right kind of Uh, you know a uh, human resource pool in this industry uh, if you are to kind of take on the challenges of, of, of the future because uh, you know the demand uh, for for logistics professionals globally just keeps growing and growing and growing so there is competition for our talent um, and uh, you know um, so i think it's going to be very challenging how do we you know ensure that we have a future ready workforce and that workforce uh, you know continues to grow and, and and kind of meets the requirements of the country even i mean uh... before covid i mean uh, we have had this issue for a really long time the talent pool right 
not only just logistic i think in the, in the entire entire uh, business or any business of sri lanka today i believe even though we speak highly of sri lanka our uh, location especially when it comes to logistics we have never looked at any uh, macro level uh, or encouraged to develop the human resource pool in sri lanka it's a very very sad situation and um, i believe this development has to happen at grassroots level uh, with the logistic being introduced uh, at a secondary school level because we must encourage the younger generation to look at and understand what is logistics and 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 their career path uh, and and also to encourage them to look at it it should not be by the way uh, you know a, a career that they should get encouraged and get excited about uh, seeing the potential uh, in the logistics obviously this won't happen overnight right and 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 i don't think we have even thought about this bringing the the logistic into our, our curriculums so in the meantime i i think as a country we have to protect the existing human resource pool to meet our requirements right even to get to the next level to to overcome many things that we have spoken before so we have to protect our our, our talent pool encourage younger generation to come in so and 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 this has to be done by ensuring the career progression you know the younger generation they want to see something exciting they want to see there is a future for them all right and and not unlike and like the time that i got into the industry and and they want to see something exciting happening and so i think the constant training development and to make sure they are we we, we give them that the exposure that global exposure and 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 to bring them to the bring them up to a global level i think while we are doing this i think we also have to remunerate them well to protect them the existing otherwise we'll see them going to countries like dubai or to bangladesh you go to bangladesh most of the companies are headed by sri lankans and it's our talent pool that we are losing so i think it's very important at grassroots level we bring logistic into our our education system into our curriculum and we spend more time on research and development and then create a career path for them and 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 to and to create an exciting journey for them for the younger generation so i think it's some of these things are really important and as a companies we have lot to do and i think we have to make a noise as an industry uh, to make sure that we are heard and 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 we have the next generation talent pool is ready to take over from us I mean together with human resources uh, Jamar I think the next aspect that we can need to look at is also the digitization of of the industry um you know what areas should we look at uh, from a national perspective and and uh, you know um what what are you guys looking at uh, from Sri Lankan perspective as well Yeah uh I agree with Tanya 100% uh, in fact I call it that uh, we have become the training center for the Middle East and airlines uh we 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 put a lot of time and investment into people and we train them to the best and then we just lose them for 500 dollars more than what we paid them so uh, you know it it has become a, a very critical issue when it comes to keeping the good staff the human resource pool that we have no the reality is i i don't think there can ever be too much of digitization or automation and and implementation of technology i think the human race has evolved through all these revolutions and they will also evolve through the information revolution it's just there will be some pain i mean we are, uh, the job of a port is not to provide employment the job of a port is to be an efficient transitor or, or a transit point for the efficient movement of goods likewise an airport likewise the customs department likewise every the government serve the public service you know or anything so i think you know the use of technology not only helps to uh, make uh, things efficient and more productive and and helps our, our rating globally and our actual effi- efficiency on the ground but it also is a great equalizer in terms of equal opportunity because if you look at our if, if you just take the sri lankan economy as an example potentially slightly over 50% of the of the potential labor market are women only 32 or 32 just under 33% of them are actually employed now that 
is a uh, that is a massive opportunity there that is available we have you know in in real terms we are looking at 15 to 17% of available labor market that is underutilized unutilized now technology will help bridge that gap because all of a sudden a crane operator doesn't have to be some uh, a dock worker doesn't have to be some macho guy who can drive a, you know sit for 6 hours in a crane uh, she can be uh, a graduate uh, who's uh, at home in front of a of a computer with a gaming console and who will run the crane from while sitting at home uh, all of a sudden you don't have to worry about women who are who can't do work the night shift because of the because of the absolutely archaic rules that we have but uh, you know they they can may, we can make uh, time and working environments around what what that that fit without a problem. So I, I think that that is you know that provides us with a great platform and an opportunity to 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 address a whole lot of other issues as well in terms of employability, in terms of female participation, women participation in the workforce. You know, if you pay, again, I go back to the shipping and logistics industry. Uh, Low, in Sri Lanka, women's participation in that industry is, you know, abysmal. Four percent, five percent is really being generous. Globally, it's 35, 40 percent, and there is no reason. And and this is including in parts of Asia, not 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 just uh, in in Western Europe and the U.S. But if you go to Bangkok, if you go to Thailand, or if you go to Vietnam, or you go to Bangladesh. You know, here we have. Women working, but they are only work. They are working in the most export-dependent uh, businesses in terms of tea and clothing and and uh, Middle East. Uh, you know, where bulk, the bulk of our foreign exchange comes from. But in terms of careers for for women leaving school, secondary school, and university, we, we don't. There's a, suddenly a complete lack of equality in opportunity. So that can be addressed. Um, uh, the second thing is the the, the amount of the cost of having people involved in this, where we have multi in every transaction, we saw this with the pandemic as one of the great moves. Within three weeks of not of everything, not people not being able to move around, we uh, there was we we achieved the electronic clearance of cargo, which had taken 30 years. You know, was 30 years in the offing. Now it was rudimentary to begin with, but it can very easily be built on. And and the government authorities like customs and the airports and the ports should not be given the opportunity of going back to the manual, uh, you know, uh, opening the drawers so that the, the bakshish can be found mm. and having a, a, a physical contact because that is what it is all about. We don't need, there is no human intervention required in these transactions. These transactions can be done electronically because all the information is available. So I think th those are, the, you know, that is where and that is the opportunity for Sri Lanka to leap. You know, we are, we are dithering around in an in an environment that is 30 years out of date. Now, we technology provides us as an industry, as an uh, to, in order to leapfrog not only for the industry but for the country into the current into the current reality at a very low cost of entry because there are no more those huge barriers. We don't need mainframes. We don't need dedicated networks. We don't need uh, you know. Uh, Closed, closed environments in which to do this. Today it is all open and it is all freely available. So I think that is a really great opportunity that we must leverage on. And that we must the, the, the pandemic has been by far the best uh, CTO that uh, digitization required. Yeah. Uh, you know, sure. uh, going uh, before, and I'll, I'll quickly tell you a very quick story about this, this resistance to technology. Um, you know, um, a software developer who makes uh, software uh, for radio stations uh, came and you know came to a college that I was running, wanted to introduce a course uh, so that you know uh, um, more people could learn how to effectively run a radio station by one or two people, right? Play the same song, you know, play the songs, commercial, etc. The director of the college was reported to me refused to introduce the software, saying that there'll be less jobs. Uh, in the radio industry. Then I pointed out to him that one of the reasons why there are so many radio stations in the world is because of the ability of, you know, having technology so that you have much more choices. And on the other hand, also, uh, you know, owners will continuously, uh, you know, find ways to uh, innovate. Either the, the employees know how to use the technology or they don't. Um, you know, so I, th I think 
the question of of um, you know winners and losers is something that needs to be kind of explained much better then i think there'll be a much better embrace of technology as well um and no one needs to be a loser really i mean there, you, yeah. you you know it's exactly. an opportunity to reskill to retrain and to to reorient which which is exactly. possible exactly and and once you are aware of those technologies you can work anywhere in the world I and mean, that is something that nobody seems to understand you can work here with manual processes but when you go overseas they expect you to know the latest technology in that industry if you don't i think you lose out a uh, final point uh, to you uh, ramesh a uh, final question to you uh, you are one of the most experienced uh, logistics professionals in this country um and and i think you can you know tell us what are from a national perspective you know what are the laws regulations and uh, the need to change um you know um even once that we have tried to change the past and got stuck uh, for this industry to move to the next level um you know it may not be decisions may not be taken in next two to three years but is the audience for economic expansion on our business leaders young upcoming business and political leaders hopefully they will hear you and they will make those changes in the in the future as well what are the big changes we need to make from a national perspective yeah so i think if i sort of uh, get down a little low you know not necessarily not not to the national level first there are i mean there's a plethora of things that we can change in terms of uh, Uh, laws and our statutory uh, issues but i think before that you know if you just look at import and export our exporters and importers and our smes and our big businesses and our big, big exporters from the big to the very small uh, i think what first need what we first need to realize is that we we have a, there is an inherent sense of entitlement which we just need to purge from our mind there is no entitlement in the world to give you free freight to cheap freight to availability of cargo when you want it available air freight at a subsidized cost sea freight containers when you need it that is bullshit you know we are competing in a global village our exports are, are have to compete globally and we have had a free ride for the last 25 years by being the last port of call so we've had cheap freight we've had free access to containers and our exporters are a spoiled bunch you know <laughs> on the basis that they are we, they are essential but they have failed to diversify their product they have failed to diversify their basket of exports they have failed to diversify their geographic uh, markets you know today we have we are still shipping to the place where everybody else wants to ship to they are still making the things that we made 30 years ago i mean that's ridiculous we should we are, there is no question you know if a cricket team doesn't play to its strengths we castigate them as a country of exporters we are not playing to our strengths so we should i think we do have a mindset change we must look for you know you, we can't suddenly stop exporting garments to europe and and the us that, that that's going to you know that, that this is a process that's going to take years but at least for now we should start for looking are there markets now we know that there is a there is a huge arbitrage of freight where you know in where you have to pay premiums in one direction and you get discounts in the other direction okay can we align exports to markets that are consuming in areas that don't have huge demand for freight can we look eastward can we look to india can we look to china can we look to to africa you know uh, are there markets available are there products that those markets need can our you know like our like the garment industry very quickly uh, pivoted to making ppe are there things that we can do you know then and 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 so are there things that we can do where we can compete effectively not only on on product but also on price on access on reach on everything so i think our industry needs to look at that our export industry needs to look at that and look at how they can address that they also need to look at the fact that for the next 2 years at least logistics and and moving cargo is going to be at a premium whether it is by sea whether it is by air it is going to be at a premium so what do sensible people do in that in that process we have to get out of this thing about whining about lack of freight and availability and get into long term contracts you you have to contract with forwarders and shipping lines and airlines because you have to be able to commit put your money where your mouth is and say okay i am in the business for the long term so i'm going to commit you know like like i'm going to commit to uh, my customer i'm also going to commit to my vendor and my supplier of 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 all these products 
importers alike, the big importers who are the, the biggest importers are those who import for free export. Now they are very organized. If you look at the companies like the MSs and the Brandixes and you know all where the where Hydramanis, their large uh, portion of their of their export is actually imported. They have a certain degree of organization in their imports, but they still represent no more than about 40 or 45 percent of our total imports. The rest of our importers who are largely informal and and some semi, you know, some formal. Lie on, we are still blissfully happy for the shipper to control the freight and for when it comes and where it comes and how it comes and at what cost it comes. That's our cost of the economy. So I think looking at the longer term, our exporters and importers must must get out of this short term mindset to take a longer term view. The second thing is customs. I mean, Sri Lanka customs really, it's, it's about time now. The pandemic has shown that we can do it if we want to. We have to make a quantum change in our approach here. You know, the whole process of border control and customs involvement. Uh, customs is, is only an agency for collecting revenue. They are not the, the cause of the revenue. You know, and, and I think there is this whole issue about why customs need to have their hands and feet on uh, and, and the touch and feet of cargo, which is uh, completely unnecessary. We should use technology and it should be exception handling more than anything else. They should only look at the exceptions and those exceptions must be deemed by fact, by intelligence, fact, by technology, by all of that. So I think customs is a huge, the, the customs in the way it is structured here is a huge hindrance to, to grow. The second thing is that, the, uh, you know, our in, uh, uh, we, we have always aspired to be a hub and, and this has been agnostic agnostic to every single political party that you know it has transcended all the different uh, the politicians of past 30 years everyone wants sri lanka to be a hub but we still don't want to do the things that will make it a hub the government is still the largest landowner you know why, why do if you look at on either side of us singapore is an extremely successful hub dubai is an extremely successful hub what does the government? What do the governments in do in those locations do? They facilitate all the developments that that are needed to make us a hub. So why are we? Why don't we have the largest freight forwarders and integrators in the world who have uh, have offices and investments here? We should ask ourselves a question: That getting land is a hassle. Getting approvals are a hassle. They you, they have to separate their freight forwarding business from their logistics business from their warehouse business. I mean, you, today if you take. A, a Schenke or a Kuna Nagel or a, uh, or a Kerry Logistics or a, 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 a DHL, they can't come and own 100% of a business here that covers the whole spectrum of their business. No, instead for their freight forwarding, they need a Sri Lankan partner. For their shipping business, they need a Sri Lankan partner who has to own 60%. For their warehousing business, yes, they have to invest so much then they can own only that. They, they are not in the business of separating their warehouse business from their trucking business from their freight forwarding business. And their shipping business, it's one thing. The, the biggest shipping lines today are integrating backwards. They're buying freight forwarders, they're buying warehouses, and they're going to take the whole chain. The airlines will do the same thing, and yes. ports are doing that. In, you know, to buy ports is becoming one of the biggest shipping lines. And we know this. And going backwards, they're also operating warehouses. So you know, we have to facilitate that without being, having all this, you know, nonsensical protection that we have, uh, which is, it's, anachronistic it is completely out of time and um, the, 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 the even and the government has a huge role to play in that because the government is the biggest landlord in this country you know we have to get over this mania about owning land we must encourage people 100 percent to come and invest in things that are on the land because the only damn thing they can't take and go you know you you build a port here that port is here forever it's sri lanka's forever you build an airport, you build a distribution center, the government should get in, you know, we should, the same way we have done in the port business, we should have public-private partnerships on logistics centers, on, 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 on logistics free zones, on parks, on warehouses, and the government should release these large tracts of land. We have a fantastic current and, and um, network of highways that will link the airport, the port, and the main city centers with some of the hinterland. We should leverage that and the government should use that. So I think those are the areas in which we should uh, look at for the future. Uh, and we can't do it. We, you know, we, there are plenty of local businesses that can do it as well, but we are not sufficiently plugged into these global supply chains. 
in order to be able to do that by ourselves it is a village the world is a village and we need to have those big guns as well here you know we, we need to have the mass clients we need to have the the, the hapagloids we need to have the shankers we need to have the panalpinas and and the carry logistics of this world the sinotrans here in sri lanka they have to see the value because we are sitting on the doorstep of the world second largest market at the moment and in 30 years from now it will potentially be the largest economy in the world so i think that's uh, those are some of the sort of immediate right. opportunities that we that i see right fascinating insights very very quickly tanya uh, chamber if you can add anything and we can conclude i think uh, ramesh touched on a lot of things what, what i feel is we should differentiate politics to the national policies right uh, if you look at today uh, we don't have any policy right every government comes in every political party they make it very political and they keep on changing so as ramesh correctly said i i represent uh, 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 public quoted companies and they are quite large in different parts of the world and they want to do great things in sri lanka first thing that worries me even to encourage them to come here is our policies keeps on changing right our taxation changes every budget we have a different rules and regulation when it comes to taxations and 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 then i mean it's very important we create this stable business uh, background for any party today to come in and invest here whether it's a minority or with the majority or any any types of business it's important and 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 and, and again going back to what ramesh said the companies don't differentiate their logistics to their freight forwarding to their transportation it's it's a one organization so they'll look at the business as a whole so so we have to be in mind if you want real investment and real businesses to come into the country we have to we have to facilitate rather than bringing all these red tapes to you know discourage them to come in and we must allow there's certain terms when they bring the business and investment into the country we can't always dictate especially not sri lanka so i think it's very important that we have these policies national policies and we differentiate those from politics and a lot of the businesses to thrive and function in like any of our, our our countries that we are actually competing against travel uh i can't agree more with the lady and the gentleman uh, i mean that, that's exactly what we need to do i mean we need to have a clear cut policy supporting uh, the, the 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 plan forward uh, i mean talk about the two airports that we have there's there's a lot of things that needs to be done if we if we really want to get the hub status uh, if you really want to use these two ports uh, to make sri lanka the preferred hub so uh, we from a national carrier point of view are trying our best to get sri lanka as the preferred hub but we alone can't do this we need to entice other airlines also to use this as the hub that's not going to come if not for a change of policy that we have at the moment uh i agree with romesh what he said the customs has to play a bigger role and they need to be uh while they, they being the regulator they also need to have uh, a plan to facilitate the business at least the next generation of business that uh, we're looking at yeah so everything has been said by the lady and the gentleman i i i will i'll keep to this yes okay um ramesh tania and samar thank you so much uh, the logistics industry in this country is blessed to have you uh, among its rank i think the country itself has you know the right kind of brain trust that requires uh, it requires to move forward um for the viewer thank you for joining us on another webinar in this series restart 2021 and hope to catch you um in the rest of this series as well thank you <laughs>